All right, everybody. Uh, welcome. This is the the Tinker Tribe podcast. I'm your host, Greg Dowd. I'm here with Nithi Bali, the the pharmacist, and um, we're uh, just here at the Self Reliance Festival here in Camden, Tennessee. And I uh, wanted to sit down with you today. Uh, we did a podcast uh, probably about a year ago or a little bit longer and just want to catch up with you on your efforts and uh, what you have going on with your food church. Yeah, we're recording. Yeah. Uh, what I mean <laughs> yeah. is we're not going to tell him to put that zipper down. Oh, yeah. It's like yeah. going blowing like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. So, um, so yes, uh, you know, the last time we talked, we got into your story, um, and, you know, you had that kind of a transformation or realization of our food system, uh, was, you know, leading to bad health for a lot of people. And so you started this food church as kind of a way to resist that. Uh, so where are you at with the food church now? And like... What are your plans going into the future? So I originally created it as a counter-economic strategy. Okay. And I also did it as a shelter for me um, to protect me from any liability because I was being accused of um, (laughs) making claims. Um, Health claims. Health claims, claims to food, you know, quality, everything. They, 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 they said that um, I was a self-proclaimed governing body. That was what they, that's what they accused me of. Mm. They, the USDA. And the, the USDA. FDA, yeah. They said, who do you think you are? Uh, you're behaving like a self-proclaimed governing body. Like, like a free thinker. <laughs> yeah. Like a free woman. Yeah. Yeah. That would be me right here. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually, I actually yeah, want to promote that everybody should hold the line. Don't give an inch. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what, what I think people don't know is that we have, you know, there's various level, levels of sovereignty. And this is often confused because you have the sovereignty that was assigned to you by God. Yeah. But then there's other sovereignty, you know, like I have sovereignty in my home, you know, for my space yeah um and for myself and for my family um and i i should also practice that for my business and i should also practice that for my community you know but how do we do this like like what do we do how how are you supposed to do that when supposedly the government is coming after us you know and so the first thing i would like to clean up for everybody because I had to clean this up for myself, okay? Yeah. I thought it was the government too. Yeah. And what what's crazy though, friends, is that the USDA, the FDA, the NCDA, the any da 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 <laughs> they're all uh, incorporated they're corporations and they all have like DMV numbers. So you can go on Duns and Brad Street and you can find their DMV numbers. Okay. You can find DMV numbers for all the prisons, all the courthouses, all the banks, all the post offices. What does that tell you? Even I've seen that the United States is a corporation through Dun and Bradstreet. It is one hundred percent. So what I what I discovered because you know you go down this rabbit hole. Yeah. And all I'm trying to do is save the babies. <laughs> Mm-hmm. All I want is for mothers to be able to make decisions for their children yeah. and for them to take care of their children. All I want is for mothers to know you know what's good for your children. Right. You don't need a doctor or somebody else to tell you what you need to do for your baby. Like yeah. you had a baby, right? you know, you know what the baby needs. Yeah. You are all the baby needs. Yeah. And they're trying to come between mothers and their children. We already know that they've taken men out of the home. Then they took women out of the home. Then they pitted the men and the women against each other. You know, like, this is the destruction of humanity. How do you do that? You just keep the, you know, the males and the females from being able to procreate, basically. Yeah. So they've created layers. I mean, layer upon layer. But everyone keeps saying they. Who is they? 
you got like Catherine Austin Bitt saying, you know, Mr. Global. You have everybody saying whatever. Well, I found out who they are. Yeah. Who is Mr. Global? You know, how is this happening? Because it all started because people were coming to me and saying, well, I want to be able to run a food church like you do. What do you do? Right. Well, you know, I it was difficult for me to put a blueprint together for them because for me to create a blueprint would require me to, like, follow some structure. And <laughs> What you're doing is outside of a normal structure of what we would consider you know, an organization or something like that, I guess. Right. I mean, when you step outside the box, you know, like, okay, so Joel Solison called me rogue, right? Yeah. And, and I was kind of like, put, like, when he said it the first time, I was just like, what? And then I had to think about it, and then I had to reconcile it, and I was like, well, I wasn't trying to go rogue, you know? I'm not trying to go against whatever. I, I mean, I'm not going trying to go against people. But they make it sound like you're going against safety and security and what's good. Yeah. And that's really wrong. Right. And I was kind of offended by that afterwards. Like, you know, it sounds cool. Like, it's a really cool conference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you're, yeah, you're going rogue. You're, you're We're going to go rogue. You're going against the grain. Right. Yeah. And But why do we have to be popularizing that idea? When it's just should be a normal human thing. I mean, what I was doing was honorable. Yeah. All I was trying to do was save the babies. Yeah. So if I'm trying to operate in honor, yeah. then why are you calling me rogue? Yeah. And I'm not saying that, you know, to put a dig in on Joel. Joel's my mentor. I mean, I love Joel. Yeah. And he knows that, right? Right. But I just, I just mean that it sounds cool. It's fun. And it's easy to sell in a world where the corporatocracy has created this competition amongst everybody. Yeah. And so if that's the only way to get everybody's attention, yeah. to bring them back to some level to where we can have a, a better conversation, I'm all for that. And that's what it's done for me. Yeah. You know, I can't say that what Joel and John did by creating the Road Food Conference didn't help that. Yeah. So I think it did help to start a conversation. Mm -hmm. Do I want to be known as like I'm rogue? No, that's not right. Yeah. And everybody should know that. Yeah. There's when you're trying to do what's right and when you're trying to do what's good, then you know I don't think anybody should be made to feel like they're the ones having to go rogue. Well, so in any case, okay. For the food church, I didn't want to try to teach people how to run this food church um, out of courage. Like, what am I supposed to say? Just go be brave. Just do it. That's what it sounds like when I talk. Like, when I'm saying things to people, it's just like, just do it. Just be brave. Like, why are you such a punk? Like, you know. Yeah. Like, man up. Yeah. But the truth is that there was certain language that I used. And I used that language just because that's how I talk. Because I found out, and I didn't realize this, but, um, you know, you know we're Indian, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so... My parents, you know, and all the Indian community only speaks British English. Oh, so, yeah. so we don't, I don't know, I don't know how to speak anything besides British English. Okay. But I speak it with my Carolina girl Southern accent. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But what I mean is that there is a certain way about and certain word choice and, and whatever that I grew up with. Okay. Which is how I express myself. Right. Because that's how they talk. Yeah. And that's how I learned to speak. Right. And so if I'm running business and someone shows up and I feel like I don't fall under their, you know, uh, like they don't have any laws over me, mm -hmm. then I just say to them, like, you're outside of your jurisdiction. And this is important because they actually are outside of their jurisdiction. Yeah. And they know it. Yeah. We don't know it because they're trying to impose regulations and statutes and mandates and all of these things that are, by the way, not laws, okay? Like if it's a statute or a whatever, I mean, all of these permissions, they're not laws. Right. It's not a law. They're, what, uh, statutes and codes? I mean, this is just, you know, it's actually, um, we are, we are under... Um, we're under military rule 
you know, mm -hmm. and people just don't understand that. Mm -hmm. And when I call them out on it, yeah, then they know I'm right. Yeah, and they know that their jurisdiction ends on the water. Yeah. So how do you go about like asserting that in your life? I say you're outside of your jurisdiction, and no. Okay. No works real good. No. I mean, no means no. Yeah. If I have to say a whole lot more words besides no, I think guys already have figured out that's, like, not a good idea. Like, no means no, right? Right. Didn't they have a whole campaign about this already? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no means no. Right. But, um, so I shouldn't have to say anything else. Right. You know, so when I say no, so this is what happens. They come, they're saying, wah, 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 wah. And I say, you know, I really don't know what you're talking about. You're going to need to put that in writing for me. Mm -hmm. And I'll say you're outside of your jurisdiction. Okay. And then they're like, rah, 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 rah. and then, you know, they're basically intimidating, intimidating. Int are you selling meat? Are you selling blah, blah, blah? Are you selling raw milk? What do you have in there? We need to, you need to be inspected. And they're pretty, like, get, they get escalated. They get escalated because I'm not escalated. Yeah. They want to escalate me and I'm not getting escalated because I just don't care, you know. Yeah. So I'm just like, <laughs> um, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I don't understand what you're saying. Yeah. But what I know is that you're outside of your jurisdiction. Okay. That's and a so really I, simple thing that people could do. Yeah. You don't want to argue with them because, A, you don't know what to say. All Everything that you say can and will be used against you. So That's a good point, yeah. You don't want to say a lot. You don't want to answer anything. You don't want, you don't want to answer questions, and you don't want to be agreeable. You also want to be honorable, and you don't want to be disrespectful. Okay. So you're honorable because we're at peace. Yeah. You know, I'm at peace. I'm not trying to war with you. Yep. I am not interested in, you know, shooting you or whatever. What I'm interested in is for you to leave. Right. I need you to leave. Right. And so I don't need to make you leave by force. If you're going to bring force to me, that's a different problem. Right. But they generally just use verbal force. Okay. And when they're saying whatever they're saying, we can be cool. I can be cool. Yeah. And be like, they can't stand it because if you just know, <laughs> if you just know the truth, then there's no reason for you to get upset. And I think society has, we've been trained. To be docile. But. And obedient. We're, but we're also um, morally outraged. So if you feel like you're getting educated on the truth and you're becoming angry, then you just are morally outraged. And you're just like, what? And you just want to protect and defend. And You know, I was that angry person too. Because my they murdered my daughter. Right. So you go through a grief process, which includes anger. And, yeah. you know, I just didn't allow myself to live in, like, vengeance or anything because I just don't believe that. Like, actually, whenever I would try to blame somebody about it, then I'd have to come back and blame myself because I was, like, I was so stupid that I let them make me believe that I need them to tell me what to do. Wow, that's, yeah, that's really powerful i think like uh a lot of people you know get caught up with the authorities telling them or somebody that they've seen as an authority like the doctors um and, and they're not like authorities that. like just for the record they're just men and women yeah they're just another human being you know and they were taught a certain thing in their schooling and education and they try to stick to that and you know i think that you know, looking into how that system was formed. If you go and look into uh, the Flexner report, yeah. uh, that you can see that uh, you know the the, the medical system, uh, the, the Rockefellers helped set up the training for uh, petrochemical pharmaceutical uh, for everything. Medication. They, look, like the that. Rockefellers created the wagon wheel, y'all. So what they did was they created this centralized wheel. They centralized everything. So they centralized, you know, the, the unlawful legal system, you know, the banking system, the education system, the medical system. 
which goes back to the education. <laughs> you know, all, all of these people are educated through their systems, okay? Yep. And so um, from, from birth, you know, we're pretty much told to do what we're told. You know, do what you're told. Yep. You know, be quiet. Sit down. Shut up. You know, and even with, with toddlers, you know, one toddler starts crying, another one starts crying, and then you're like, stop crying. You know, I'm taking care of him. This, this is none of your business. And they're trying to hug and love on each other and make each other stop crying, right? Yeah. So you are trained to stop caring about each other at that very early age in your life. Hmm. And this is really, really important because the generative principle is one is is the most important principle of natural law. Mm-hmm. And that is actually essentially the principle to care. Yeah. And if you're not allowed to care, then you can't actually create your own life. Yeah. Right. You can't take you can't you can't complete the hoop. The beginning of the hoop is the mentalism, right? Mm-hmm. So thoughts are things and are you know, what are your belief systems? It's just, you know, the thoughts you keep thinking. Yep. And they, you know, religion is only your belief system, which is just the thoughts you keep thinking. Yep. But they make you believe that you were born into something or whatever, you know, this whole system. They also make you believe that, you know, um, there's good, you have to be good or bad. And if you're bad, all the times that you're bad, you're going to pay for that one day when you're dead, you know, or you're going to be rewarded for it when you're dead. Yeah. Neither one of which matters to me. Like, I'm not trying to be funny. Like, I'm not saying that I I don't care. Because I actually, my problem is I care too much. (laughs) But, but, you know, I, I, this is, these are polarizing thoughts. These are polarizing ideas. And polarity is another one of the natural principles. The the, the law of nature principles. So, they're constantly trying to polarize you. And, and, and honestly, what I've realized is that in this lifetime, you're supposed to choose. This, the free will that everybody talks about, that God's free will or whatever, right. is just for you to choose. Are you going to choose to be positively polarized or negatively polarized? Okay. You don't have to think about it as good and bad. Just think about it as positively or negatively. And the biggest thing about that is, should you choose to go negative? You have to be 95% negative to be able to graduate to the next level of consciousness. If you want to, mm. like, accelerate your consciousness, yeah. then you have to graduate in this see it, feel it, touch it world that we're in. Yeah. And, and you can, and, and we're encouraged to be polarized towards positive, positivity, just because it's easier. It's the path of least resistance. Mm. But it doesn't matter what you pick. You just have to pick one. Okay. You can't have both. Right. But if you're going to pick negative, you got to freaking be the most hateful somebody. And I don't know about you, but, like, it's exhausting to be angry. Yeah, it is. <laughs> like, I can't. I, I, to I, harbor anger yeah. and hold that in. It's a lot. It's very, it really very exhausting. will mess with you. Yeah. yeah. So, like. Obviously, I've got a lot of reasons to be angry. I have a lot of reasons to hate a lot of people. Yeah. You know, like, somebody murders your kid, you're going to freaking hate them. But, like, my thing was, I was so stupid, and I can either hate myself, I can be mad at myself, I can just, you know, what am I going to do? You know, I can right. I can do all these things, or I can just move on and just say, okay, this bad thing what did I do yeah. for that to happen? Oh, I won't be doing that again. And that thing was that I was allowing other people to control me. Mm. And they were allowed to control my thoughts. And I had to allow it. And that was the... That was my, you know... That was the problem. I had to wrestle with the fact that I allowed it. Yeah. And then I had to reconcile that somehow. Yeah. And so I had to just be like, you know what? fuck it like I can't I can't I can't do this right I'm not gonna just kill myself like what do I want now I don't want to be here for my other two children right I don't want to be here for my husband I don't want to be here for anything else right or am I gonna just get over it and I don't mean that I'm over like the death of my child no no that'll never go away like that's not what I mean what I mean is that 
I have to make that worth something. Yeah. I have to use it for something better than that. Yeah. And if I don't, then that's just stupid. Right. Like, I just, that's just dumb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then, like, I have to know that I have to love myself enough to want more for me. Yeah. And my daughter wouldn't have wanted that for me. No. You know, she would be like, Mom, what are you doing? Yeah. You know? So, like, she was, like, very mature. And, I, I mean, she really was, like, a, a compass for me. And she used to call me out on things. Oh, yeah. She was. She was, she was like, beyond her years. And the things that she would say to me, I had to remember that, you know? And I was like, oh, uh, what am I going to do with this? And I was like, you know what? They're just murdering babies in the hospital. Yeah. Like, that was what it came, what it boiled down to for me was, I just sat in the hospital with her for six months so that she could show me that they are literally murdering children. Wow. And it's just all under the guise of, you know, children's hospitals. What the hell? And then I put more thought into it, and I go, you know, Man, I know children's hospitals when I was growing up. Yeah. Wait a minute. Where did that come from? And then I started looking at all of that. And then I started looking like, wait a minute. Kids were never sick. I never had a headache when I was a kid. Yeah. I couldn't remember ever having a headache. Yeah. Like not ever, not even one time. Yeah, wow. And I was just like, wait a minute. We used to like sleep on the floor. We could sleep on rocks. It was like, no, it was nothing. We just could, could we just lay down? Yeah. You know, it was fine. You know, it didn't matter. Yeah. And and I was like, what is going on? What is causing all what this is childhood disease? Right. Then I was like, what in the world's happening here? Like, I don't know. But then the more I looked into every little thing, then, you know, this is before GMOs. This is before, you know, like nobody was talking about all that stuff. And so, like, Jeffrey Smith had written his book. And it was, it actually came out in 2009. What is that book? Uh, genetic Roulette. Genetic Roulette, okay. Yeah. So he was first revealing GMOs and Genetic Roulette. Okay. And if you haven't read that book, you need to read that book. Genetic Roulette. <laughs> yeah. That's like from 2009. It's old now. <laughs> but, okay. I mean, now they have all this stuff on GMOs. But, but at that time, he was just bringing it to the forefront. Okay. And it had already been around because, you know, thanks, Rockefellers. This is, you know. <laughs> what, so, so, I mean, whatever they have done, it's so very well thought out. Like, they're freaking brilliant. You have to give it to them, okay? Yeah. Like, they created this system, self imploding, destructive, horrible, hateful system. Yeah. And, very, so, an, very anti-life. But you know, they don't do any. They don't take any of the action to cause any of that harm. We do it to ourselves. The thing that's so <laughs> genius about it is they 100% operate in hermetic law. Yeah. They 100% operate in hermetic law, and they know it, and they don't do anything. They put ideas in people's heads, and then they, the people who they put it in their heads, they do it. And yep. then the person who takes that wrong action is the one who is dealing with the negative consequences. That's why they're never dealing with it. So they just come up with it, and it's just like a freaking game. Like when you, it's kind of like if you're so bomb at like whatever the mind game is, and you keep winning and winning and winning, that you don't even care what it is that you're doing that's making you win. You're just like, watch this. Yeah. You know, watch this. I'm gonna make them do this now. Yeah. And then you're just making people do these crazy things. Yeah. And they're just freaking doing them. Mm -hmm. And it's like they're just high on that. Generation after generation of these sickos. But, and they're just like, son, watch, got him to do watch this. this. Look at this. Yeah. You know, and then they tell their son, watch, watch what they do while we chill back, you know, and just eat the popcorn or whatever they're doing. Yeah, I've talked. Well, they're not eating the popcorn. <laughs> That's what we know. <laughs> yeah, I've talked about this a lot, is that, you know, uh, we're only to blame ourselves for our ignorance. Um, our no science. Yeah, our net, you know, nescience is like you have no awareness of the problem, right? And then ignorance is, okay, I've been confronted with some information, but I'm choosing to ignore it. Right. 
And I think that's the majority of the people. I think that's the key with people is that, you know, they see the thing, but mm -hmm. sometimes they might get too overwhelmed by it. See, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. Yeah. Like, I, I hear you. Yeah. I can't understand it. For me, it's like if somebody like does. I'm You're like, like what? What do you happened? Do that for? <laughs> yeah, you know, I just don't get it. Like, I I would want to know, you know. And if they said, well, actually, la 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 la, and then I can't unhear that. Then now I want to know more. Like, what are you talking about? Well, we talked about this a little <laughs> bit yesterday before we came out here and uh, talked that uh, that the approach with people, like, how do you you, you got to come at them like with love, I think. Yeah. And you got to have like kind of a, I guess you have to give them a little bit of uh, grace. Grace. That's good. Yeah. A little bit of grace because they have been fed all this garbage that, that they need to overcome in their mind. And how, you know, how do you break through? Like, I think also um, yeah. <clears throat> a lot of people just say to me, well, you know, I'm fine. Nothing's happening to me. I've heard that a lot too. Yeah. And, and and they don't understand how arrogant they sound. You know, it's just it's really arrogant. Yeah, I mean you think that nothing's happening to you, but it's happening, you know, it's already happening. It's already yeah. happening. It's already happening to you. And I it's mean, gonna get worse if you <laughs> keep ignoring the problem. Yeah. I mean, I think it's fascinating, like if I tell everybody like you're being poisoned. You know, well, I don't feel like I'm being poisoned. Like, you know, well, I don't care what I eat. I don't care what I do. Okay. I mean, how long is that okay for? Until you get diabetes or <laughs> even cancer. If they, even if they or... have the diabetes. Even if they have the cancer. You know, oh, what about the people that have the cancer? You know, oh, my God. Nah, nah, nah. Now you want me to feel sorry for you. Well, I just don't. Like, I can't. You know, and I'm not saying that cold-heartedly, but, like, I had to reconcile the fact that my daughter had cancer because we were idiots, okay? Yeah. And so, at this point, I'm like, I know we're idiots. And I've told my husband and my children, like, don't be an idiot. <laughs> we already did that, you know? Yeah. We're not going to do it again. Yeah. And so, I have no qualms about telling my son or my daughter, like, take that out of your mouth. What are you doing? You know? Like, right. I didn't bring you in this world to just commit suicide. Right. So, like, if you're going to try to commit suicide, don't do it in front of me. Right. You know? Yeah. Go hide somewhere in a corner and do that. But, like, do not get in my face and do that. Yeah. Like, the nerve of you to yeah. do that. Yeah. And, you know, everybody else is like, oh, come on, they're just kids. What the heck? What are you talking about? Like, my one daughter is dead. I'm not, it's, it is not okay. Right. So, I'm not fine with it. And, you know, people are like, well, I mean, even Joel Solomon's like, you are so militant. You were so militant about this. And also, he knows why. Also, he knows. Yeah. You know? So, he's not trying to talk me out of it or anything. But I am so militant about it because, hey, one of my kids is dead. If you saw a child get burnt alive in a fire, and then they go back and they keep playing with fire like other kids, are you fine with it? You fine? You're okay? Right. Oh, they're just kids. Come on. Let them play with fire. You know, that's what it looks like to me when you, when you say to me, like, I am some kind of overreactive, overprotective, you know, whatever bubble wrap mom. Mm -hmm. First of all, I don't bubble wrap my children. My children have, they make money. They've been making money since they were kids. They can get whatever they want. They don't, they're, they don't live in a house with bars. Like, they can just walk outside and leave. Yeah. You know, they've yeah. freely been walking around, walking in the streets for a long time. Yeah. You know. They have autonomy. Yes. They have full autonomy. My, You know, now my kids are, are driving, you know, so. Oh, wow. Like, whatever. I can't. What do you want me to do? Like, you know, <laughs> I, I just, I am just in their head. Yeah. All the time. I don't. I don't hold back anything that I want to say to them because it's all I have. That's all I can offer them. That's, yeah. that's the only inheritance I can give them. Yeah. And so I make sure I'm always in their head. Now I'm not in their head. Like, Hey, when you go out today, me, 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 I don't do that. 
because I don't have energy for negative praise. Right. Like I just don't. Yeah. But I'm, and this is where it goes back to the negative and the positive polarity. They have to be able to make their own decisions. They have to choose themselves the negative and the positive. Yep. And all I can say to them is, all right, you know, don't die. Have fun. Yeah. And then I, I also say, hey, go be dangerous. And they're just like, what? <laughs> what? And the first time I said that, the first time my son, <laughs> my son was leaving, and uh, it was the first time he was out going driving by himself. And he's like, all right, Mom, I'm doing it. I'm going. And I was like, all right. I said, listen, you better be dangerous. And he was like, what? I go, dangerous people are formidable. Yeah. You know, go yeah. be dangerous. Don't be safe. Get home. Yeah, and okay. I'll see you later. <laughs> and every time they leave, I forget that they're gone because if I try to sit around and be like, oh my God, they're out on the road driving the car, you know. I know mothers who like track their kids on their phones and all this other crap. And I'm like, no. They're like, do you know where you're so No, I don't. I don't know where he's at. He's right. free. Yeah. He's he's somewhere. Yeah. I mean, the rules with my kids are, hey, let me know where you're planning to be. Okay. And let me know about how long you want to be wherever. Yeah. Because if I can't find you because I'm busy doing something. I need to know how to track you down. Right. I just need to know where you're supposed to have been yep. so that I'll know where to start looking. Because, you know, you could go very far in a car. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, my kids also know I am not tracking them down. Yeah. You know, I'm not looking for them. I'm not going, what were you doing there? Who were you with? I don't, I don't do that. They actually tell me. Yeah. You know, they tell me, hey, yeah. we were, we we're going to go to da-da-da, and we want to do la-la-la, and we're going to do this and that. And I'll be like, great. Are you sure that's what you're going to do? Yeah. Okay. What are you going to eat? I don't know yet. All right. Do they know what they're going to eat? Because, you know, they don't even care, right? And they're like, you know, so we have these kind of conversations, and I just kind of say, well, you know, I have food. If you guys want to bring your friends over, they can all eat. You just let me know. You know, call ahead. Okay. And whatever. I said, or there's leftovers in the fridge. You know, like feed them. Don't go out and eat crap. You yeah, know, yeah. There's always like food ready. Or, you know, or make sure you eat before you leave. So you're not, we're, we're so carnivore anyway. Like they don't, my kids don't snack. Oh yeah. So we don't we don't snack, and so they don't really get hungry. They can go a long time without eating. Yeah. And so even even if they go somewhere and they're hanging with, they're more interested in being able to be with the cool friends and you know do the friend thing. They don't care if their friends want to stop somewhere to get food. They don't need to eat. Yeah. And they just won't. They'll just be like, yeah, no, you go ahead and have something. I don't want anything. You know. So they'll do that, but. And someone asked me if I knew that was, if it was true or not. Like, are they really doing that? And I said, well, I can usually see it right on their face. <laughs> if yeah. they start breaking out in acne, if they start having, you know, getting sick, because they'll fall into the flu or something, you know, and they know it. If they eat anything they shouldn't eat or whatever, it's they're not, they're not, gonna, yeah, they're not going to feel good. Yeah. And so, or they're going to look like other teenagers. <laughs> And, wow, that yeah. is amazing that, uh, yeah, if you can adopt that diet. And, and I have seen it myself, like, with uh, a bunch of different people talking about their results when they've uh, eliminated a lot of the, uh, and just gone straight carnivore. Mm -hmm. um, the, a lot of their problems with their skin cleared up, like, grew better hair, mm -hmm. you know, stronger fingernails. Um, there was one lady that, uh, or one presentation I was listening to yesterday. The guy was talking about his wife was, uh, he was the butcher over here. And, oh, yeah. and he was talking about how his wife was a vegetarian until she got pregnant. Uh, and she was like, I need the meat. I need the meat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then the alien is like, <laughs> like <laughs> my son, when I was pregnant with my son, I couldn't eat anything but burger. Really? Like nothing but burger. Yeah. And, I mean, I would want burgers all the time. Yeah. All the time. And I didn't know anything then, and we weren't, like, keto or carnivore or anything. But, I mean, I ate so much meat. Mm -hmm. I mean, I ate straight meat the whole time. And I couldn't even look at anything green. I didn't want any vegetables, nothing. Yeah. It was straight meat. 
-hmm. And I mean, I think I used to eat probably like four or five burgers a day yeah. when I was pregnant with him. And that was on a, just a light day because I used to, and my husband thought I was crazy. And also, we didn't eat good. I mean, we would. I would. I would cook at home if, if you know, whatever. But you know, when you're pregnant, all of a sudden you're you're like ravenous, and you're just like, I'm gonna throw up if I don't eat. Like you just get really nauseous all of a sudden, mm. and you can't get up, so you can't cook to eat. You mm. just need to eat. Yeah. And um, and you're like, if I get up, I might throw up. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I need to eat, and it is just like really dumb. And so sometimes my husband would grill if we had meat. Like I started making sure that I had meat thawed out. Yeah. But a lot of times I wouldn't think about it because I don't know, just busy doing something. Yeah. And I wasn't even working. It wasn't like no, I was working. I was working. I was working. Um, yeah, that was the problem. I was working and I was in the street. I forgot. I forgot I had a job then. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, well, because you know, I kept thinking because when you don't have kids, you don't know. Right. You're like, I'm going to have this baby, and I'm just going to keep on working, and it's going to be like this. And I had a whole idea in my mind about what it was going to be like. Yeah. And then he was born, and he was four pounds, and I was like, oh, my God, I can't leave him with anybody. Yeah. And I just started crying. I told my husband, I was like, you don't have to ever take me anywhere, but, like, I can't go to work. Yeah. I was like, I don't care if I never eat out again. I don't care if we never go on vacation. <laughs> yeah. I quit doing my nails, everything. I was like, no, I just need to to be home with yeah. this baby and he thought I was crazy but he did it he's like I think that's not going to be a great idea I was like I don't yeah. care I was like I'm not leaving him so that's pretty much what's happening I'm not giving him <laughs> some stranger to come watch him or something I was like, like I don't even know who I would leave him with like what are you talking about you know like I, can't, I don't know how anybody does this it's so many people do it and uh, I, I take their kids to daycare yeah. or um, I mean I thought I was gonna a nanny something like that yeah I mean I had a plan yeah I mean we had a place I thought I was gonna go there yeah I thought it was actually so awesome because it was like you know Spanish immersion and my babies are gonna learn Spanish and, or whatever I mean I thought this is gonna be like something like yeah. a thing I couldn't leave him anywhere I was just like no he'll just be with me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said and I tried to work with him and I tried to, you know, make it all work out. I was like, I quit. And I just told my husband, sorry, I'm quitting. I'm staying home. Just deal with it. <laughs> Very cool, yeah. And he was just, he was, he was great. Yeah. Like, he didn't have to be that way. But he was just like, he goes, okay. He goes, we'll figure, he goes, well, you make it, you know, make, just let me know. <laughs> it was like, figure it out. make the bills work. Yep. And, you know, we would be, if we were short some money, then I just had to figure out what I was going to do to make the money. Yeah. You know, and then, and actually it, was, it wasn't very long because it's not like I'm just going to sit there and do nothing. No. For the whole day. Yeah. So, like, after like six months or so, I figured something out. And then I figured another thing out. You know, you just kind of do these little things. Start playing with some things. And yeah, I was like, I don't know what, what I'm going to, yeah, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but... But anyway, amidst all of, I, I just decided I'd started working at the Y, because I could bring him, and oh. he could just be with me all day. Okay. And and then when he would be old enough, we would be able to get discounts on their classes or programs or whatever for the kids. Yeah. And I could be there. Hmm. You know, I was like, oh. And it gave us just enough money to fill in a little gap of whatever with our bills. With your bills. And so. I was like, okay, well, that'll work. It can work, yeah. Yeah, I can go. I mean, I could take them. I could nurse them at work. I could take care of the other kids and do whatever. And it kept us. They gave us a free membership. My husband could go work out and, you know, whatever we were at. You know, we had a membership for yeah. the gym or whatever. And we had a community. So it was cool. And actually, that community is what lifted us. The YMCA and our community or in our neighborhood was the one that supported us while we were in the hospital and with everything that was going on with our daughter. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was a big deal. Oh. Wow. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Community is a big deal, and it always was a big deal, and they all they all rose. When I started the food church, Yeah. everybody joined. They didn't even cook. I found out. That was when I found out my... That was when I found out our friends didn't cook. <laughs> I was like, you guys don't cook. They would literally buy like one pound of ground beef a week or okay. something. Yeah. And I'm like, you guys have got to be starving. But I will say that 
they were committed. They joined because there was a membership fee and all this stuff. Yeah. And they, all of them, participated for a solid two years oh, to wow. like help me just get it going or whatever. Yeah. And you could tell they didn't care about it. Like it was not the priority in their life. Yeah. But it was. I was a priority in their life. You were a part of their community, and they wanted to support you. Yeah. Right. So that was a big deal for them. Yeah. And then when it became too much, or whatever, it had been two years, and they would be like, "Okay, this is this is, this is our time." or whatever you want to look at it as. Yeah. But they 100%, like I will never forget that they did that. Yeah. It was beautiful. That's really cool. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah. So, you wanted to talk about some stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you, uh, I guess you were talking about like uh, starting some classes or some kind of workshop the last time uh, that we talked. It like uh, has, has that developed with uh, the food church or are you guys still providing and um, getting with the local farmers and bringing the meat to like a location still and doing all that so our members come to us and shop Mm -hmm. every week and so that's still there it's exactly like it was except that I think me and you we, we, we talked before 2020 right yes I think well uh, no, 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 it was in, in Tennessee, right? No, 20, uh, 21. Oh, it was after I moved. It was after the Rogue Food Conference. Okay, right. In Tennessee, right? In Tennessee, in Lewisburg. Yeah, uh, okay, okay. And then we talked after So this that. was after 2020. We, so I was in brick and mortar by then again. Yep. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so <laughs> we... The membership is strong, you know, everybody's still supporting that, but, and I was trying to figure out how to do the food church work, workshop, because Rogue Food, behind Rogue Food, people were wanting to take a workshop to learn how to open up their own food church. Yeah. And so, I wanted to be able to tell everybody how to do this, but, you know, like I, like we started at the beginning, okay, we were saying, you know, I didn't want to just be like, go be brave and just do it, just dive in. Yeah. So, like, you can't do that. You need to know how... You need to know what is happening in the world so that you know how to operate. Okay. So there's a couple of things you guys need to know. And I want you to follow my YouTube channel to get details because this conversation is very big. Yeah. And so it's not every, it's not something I can just say right here in five minutes or something. No, yeah. So what you need to know is that we are operating in a feudal system in the world. I don't think everybody really knows that. I don't think people believe that that is what actually is still in place. Yeah. It's very like, you know, kings and vikings still, okay? And so in that, in that, um, we still operate in universal jurisdictions, which include the air, the water, and the land, or okay. land, air, and water, which is law, L-A-W, it's an acronym. Okay. So... Land is, is uh, like, we the people, or the living men and women, have jurisdiction over the land. Yeah. And uh, the crown has jurisdiction over the water. Mm-hmm. And the pope is Mr. Global. Yeah. And the pope has jurisdiction over the air, which is over the land and the water. Mm. So that, that's the highest jurisdiction. Mm. Well, actually... The highest jurisdiction is general jurisdiction, which we, living men and women, have. But for us to invoke our general jurisdiction, we need to know who we are. Yeah. That requires an education. Yeah. So knowledge is required, and if you don't have this knowledge and you don't try to seek it, then you, you remain incompetent because you have, um, an inheritance. We've been given an inheritance. It's a, it's a big inheritance. Yeah. And we don't have to live paycheck to paycheck and day to day. You're not sovereign, actually, unless you're financially sovereign. Yeah. And so there is a there are many of us that are are reclaiming our inheritance. And in order to do it properly, there is an order that that is required to be followed. And so we, do you know that nobody knows, no, hardly any living soul anymore knows that we would have never had a president? 
Did you know that? Uh, when they started the Congress, it was from the Articles of Confederation, and there were several guys at the Articles of Confederation that walked out of the uh, Constitutional Convention, from what I have read. And uh, there was a big protest over creating a centralized uh, federal government. They wanted to remain in a confederation. There was a large group that wanted to remain a confederation of the uh, states. So we weren't a confederation. We were the federation. Okay. So some of these stories are false. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to tell you which ones weren't or no. which ones weren't because, look, when mom and dad have a fight, the children hardly ever know what the truth is about what happened, right? Yeah. Well, I wasn't alive. I can't tell you about something right. that happened when I was not living. Yeah. All I can do is trace the paperwork. Trace the source mm -hmm. documents. Yeah. Right. So what I happen to know for a fact is um, I what I, these are the things that I know to be true, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's plenty of stories, but... This is the undisputable truth that mo like many of us know, and no one has disputed, much like in the way of the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, like the Bible, is, like, no one can dispute it. No one has ever disputed it. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the Bible is included in this. The Geneva Bible, specifically, is a book of commerce, and it explains how to do commerce correctly. Okay. So, there was... Um, William the Conqueror. He yep. was a French king. Okay. So, William the Conqueror, he, um, had, he conquered England. Okay. So, when William the Conqueror conquered England, then he wanted to deprive his sons of that land as a strategic move. What he did instead was he distributed that land to his 13 barons because he never wanted there ever to be another British monarch. Okay. What does that tell you? Hmm. That, uh... There's never been another British monarch. Let's okay. Know that. Okay? Yeah. That's one, that's one important piece to know. Because aren't, aren't the current British family, they're German or something like that? I don't know. They're fake. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not really the monarchy. Like, we don't I don't know. I don't get it. You know, Somehow I mean, they just personally, I will just say yeah. that I'm pretty sure they're like Pope Mafia, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> let's just call them that. Okay. Uh, that's what I'm going to call them. Okay. So, because that's how they behave. They behave like the muscle for the Pope. Mm. The crown. Yeah. Is the dirty muscle for the Pope. Yeah. Okay. Because there's never been another monarchy. But there's something else incredible. Like that, William the Great, that was a great thing that he did. Mm. He made all those barons sovereigns in their own right. Mm. And which meant that they were able to operate in international commerce. Okay. This is what was required to do international commerce at the time. Okay. And not just at that time, but even right now. Yeah. Because we're still in a feudal system. Okay. So, <laughs> so William, William the Conqueror. He gives the 13 barons sovereignty in their own right. Gives them their own land parcels. Makes their land overlap each other. Mm -hmm. Because he doesn't want them to fight amongst themselves. Okay? Yep. Then, one of those barons, mm -hmm. William um, Belcher, he came to the new land in 1608. And he started to build Boston. He came and they built a church. They were Lutherans. And they were, um, you know, building the community, and they built Boston. Okay. They actually, um, that church that they built is still there. Hmm. It still stands there. So, you know, that 1608, then we had the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. When we had the Revolutionary War, um, then, you know, we won the war, but we were really depleted with our military, I mean, our army and everything, you know. And we had no other military, right? And, of course, the 13 colonies were just ripe for the picking, mm -hmm. you know? You think that, you know, our war with England was bad? I mean, the French were some powerful people, and they owned, hello, most of the southern states. 
and all the way up the center of the nation and into French Canadian area land and whatever. I mean, they had a lot of land. Oh, yeah, yeah. The so, Louisiana Purchase went way up in the States, yeah. Yeah, so that's the French. Yep. So just think about this, okay? Mm -hmm. So the other thing I want you to know that I didn't know because, you know, when I was in school, I took the test, I knew the years, but I never really made a timeline because I didn't want to because I was seven or eight or ten or whatever. I don't, I don't even know how old you are when you learn this stuff. Yeah. But, like, what I know is that I was never going to make a timeline. I was just going to memorize the dates because that's all they wanted me to do. Right. And then they made, they made us believe, and obviously we're stupid enough not to do the math because if you, if you do the math with the dates, then, then it doesn't work, okay? But, but if you don't do the math and they just tell you, hey, you know, we've enslaved blacks for 400 years, mm -hmm. then you just know it and think it, right? Yeah. And believe it. Yeah. And isn't that what we're told? Yep. Over 400 years, we're so evil, right? Well, that's funny because the time between the Revolutionary War and the Civil War is less than 80 years. Mm -hmm. Also, there are documents where Abraham Lincoln was talking to some of our founding fathers. Mm -hmm. There are documents mm -hmm. where they're talking to each other. Yeah. That means they were alive at the same time. Yeah. And he wasn't 400 years old, y'all. He wasn't. Right. They weren't. Nobody was. They, I mean, so that was within the same time period, mm -hmm. which means we didn't enslave people for over 400 years. Right. Okay. All right. I know black people hate me right now, but like, whatever. I'm Indian. Okay. And India was under a British rule for 400 years also. British East that, India Company. Yeah. So that was also 400 years, they tell us. And then when I trace that back, that's not, I mean, look, the world was enslaved, and there was a lot of people enslaving certain parts of India. Everywhere in the world, the yes. in humanity, there was, everybody was enslaving each other. Right. All, all that was happening was that humanity was enslaved, and our forefathers came to the new land to escape enslavement. Yep. That was all it was. Yep. They said they came here for religious freedom. That meant free thought. Like religion, your beliefs, the thoughts we keep thinking. They wanted to come here to be free, to think freely. And that was all. And they didn't want to be enslaved. That was that was what that language meant. The yep. British English. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what that meant. Religious freedom. That's what it meant. It didn't yeah. mean that, you know, we want to be free to be, you know, Southern Baptist versus Catholic or whatever. That's not the point. Yeah. <laughs> it was just that we want to be free thinking. Yeah. So, and obviously they're radically self-reliant. And moreover, they were hermetic practitioners as evidenced by the constitution that they created. Now, the other big lie is that they want us to believe that we operate under this constitution, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Let's get back here to the Civil War. Yeah. Okay, what, what happened? So we only, first of all, were just the 13 colonies. So. Yeah. Hello, we were just 13 colonies. They want us to believe that we had all these southern slaves and all. We didn't even have all the southern states. Yep. So we weren't the ones enslaving them, but the French were, and they were evil. I mean, the French were really, really bad, so much so that people were, like, excited when this, when Spain, you know, like, came and enslaved them. Like, the Spaniards were apparently nicer than the French. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I wasn't alive. But, but supposedly this is the kind of thing. I mean, when you read all the history, then the French were like not to be messed with. Okay, so it was, they were pretty scary. All right, so where are we at? We we have the supposed civil war. So what's happening is that our 13 colonies, our 13 state assemblies, were in. Um, they were having a, a, a general assembly meeting. Okay, so they're having a general assembly meeting. They want us to believe that that was this constitutional convention or whatever, but it was a general assembly meeting. Okay, and maybe it was a constitutional convention because when you want to make trade agreements with other nations, then you have to create a constitution because those are the limiting powers that you offer the people that you are contracting with as your subcontractors. 
-hmm. And in our case, what was happening was that we wanted to be able to trade freely with, um, you know, the rest of the world. Well, to be able to do that, you needed a sovereign, all right? And the only person that we had to be a sovereign was William Belcher from Boston. Mm. And so he didn't really want to have all the powers and every, all the responsibility that comes with being the only sovereign for the nation. And so it's his coat of arms that we use as our great seal. Huh. So our great seal is the Belcher coat of arms. Okay. And William Belcher, you know, has has a great, great, great grandson <laughs> who's alive today. We'll come back to that. Let's get back here for a second. Mm -hmm. So he decided he did a great thing because he didn't want this responsibility. So that under the Revolutionary War, before the Civil War, but I just wanted to make it clear to everybody that this all happened within a 80-year period. Yeah. 80 years or less. I mean. Do the math. Research it. I'm not telling you because, A, like, don't quote me, and, B, do your own research. Yeah. Also, C, don't leave any comments about how I don't know what I'm talking about. Like, go find it out. It's not more than 80 years. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So, go look it up for yourself. Yeah, go look it up. You need to know this stuff for yourself. You need to go find it out. And you need to know the truth, and you need to be able to tell the story yourself. So, also, we weren't alive then. Also, this is not totally hearsay because I'm telling you a story that I heard from the Belcher family. So, that's what I'm telling you. There was an, a proposal at this assembly meeting. And they proposed, hey, it went something like, you guys already have all the blacks enslaved. Why don't we free them and then just enslave everybody? And here's how we would do it. And there was a proposal about how they would do it. And apparently nobody liked it, and there was a walkout. Well, this is a problem, because when you have an assembly meeting, and some and people just walk out, and you don't adjourn, what do you do? Yeah, I mean, it should be a fraudulent thing or something like that, it it's, seems like. It's called breaking quorum. Breaking quorum was just... When yeah. you break quorum, what that does... It's very dangerous. What that does is that opens you up to the usurp. I got you. And so, honest Abe usurped us. Yeah. Because he was an attorney. And what I know about our her hermetic practicing forefathers is they were not going to allow the corporatocracy ever. And we were never going to have a president because we didn't have a president. We had a head of state. You had a head of state, you had a judiciary, and that was we the people. We were self-governing. Yeah, that was the... We were self-governing. I believe that was the original intent, yeah. If you're self-governing, you don't need a president. If you're self-governing, you don't police yourself. If you're self-governing, you have to be responsible for everything. Yep. And we're not self-governing. We didn't. I grew up being self-governing. I grew up following the rules, having permission, needing a license, blah, 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 do they know, right? Being quiet, not caring, you know, shutting up, yep. standing in line, just like a good little prisoner, okay? That's what I was doing. So, think about this. Go find this information out for yourself, but follow me on YouTube where I'm breaking it down with James Belcher, who is currently alive. Okay. His wife, Anna, she is Anna Marie uh, Reis Reisinger. She's a, she's a justice. She and her husband, her husband didn't know who he was until he was 60. Okay. He didn't know who he was. His mother was on her deathbed, and when she was 80 and on her deathbed, she told him who he was and what that responsibility meant. Mm -hmm. Because his great great grandfather, I'm calling him great great grandfather. I don't know what what he was exactly. Just know that he's the direct, he's the direct descendant, the hereditary um, head of state for America. That's what you need to know. Um, because he also has a signet jewelry. He has the ring. He also has the footprint that matches the birth certificate that that proves who he is. So. He has already established his lineage, okay? So, what you need to know is that they're the only ones who know the truth and know how this works. 
And so they took it upon themselves. Like when they found out, when Anna and, and James found out what was going on, they were like, well, we, got, we can't be the only ones. You know, because his whole life, his parents, they, they kept them in the trade industry and they kept moving every time they lived like gypsies, basically, because they needed to keep their son alive. Mm. And that's what they did for all these generations mm. between the Revolutionary War and now. Hmm. Which is insanity. And so now the mother tells, you know, tells him who he is. And he's 60. And they're like, oh, my God, we got to do something about this. And so he's done another great thing. So this is part of the, what are the, the Belcher family is yes. what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now there, they, there were, there's only certain sovereigns that can now, after 150 years of our We the People actual government having been dormant because we haven't reconstructed post-civil war which wasn't even a war but whatever in the world it was right but whatever that was <laughs> when abraham lincoln usurped us right, right. when Abr abraham lincoln usurped us because we broke quorum yeah the thing that everybody doesn't really understand is that we our land and soil organic government was never like destroyed or anything and our constitutional compact maintained our land and soil jurisdiction for us yeah we just had to come to quorum and we needed to rise as assemblies but if okay. we it's kind of like if you are you know your mom and dad give you a store and you own it and you run it and then you get some good employees and then they're doing a good job and then you go on vacation and you're like dude they're doing such a good job and you just leave and you just keep coming back and they're still doing a good job and then you just leave and you just are like bye you know and then you come back and you're like wait a minute i don't like how this is being done 150 years later yeah <laughs> wait a minute it's kind of out of control a, yeah this is a little out of control we don't really like this what's going on yeah and now you're just like wait a minute well, so in order to get it back under control, all 50 states had to rise in assemblies. Now, that's a Herculean move. How do you get anybody to even believe this is true? And that's what Anna says. She says, you know, me and James were just like, well, nobody but me, you, and that tree outside knows who you are. And, you know, who's going to believe this? Yeah, you got to do a lot of digging. So they had a lot of work to do. Yeah. And they've spent the last 30 years doing that. Yeah. And in, in addition to all of that, they they had to go. They had to meet with the Pope. They had to go put the Pope and the Vatican and the Crown on notice and say, hey, we're rising. Okay, we're going to rebuild. We're going to reconstruct this government. And in order to reconstruct the government, you have to, you know, do certain things. It has, there's an order in which you have to do this. And so... Pope Benedict knew this. He was the one who was put on notice. And he actually counseled Anna. And he helped her. She wrote a book called Disclosure 101. Go read it. That book explains her whole experience of how she found out and what they were doing. And people started saying that she was, you know, working for the Pope and all this stuff, which is ridiculous. She's a Lutheran. But <laughs> so she's like, I'm not even Catholic, okay? So that was not what was happening. But they all went before the Pope and explained to him the atrocities and the crimes against humanity. And then the Pope said, well, I need someone to help us. This is a really big mess, and we need to clean it up. And for us to be able to clean it up, you know, I need a volunteer who's going to help us do the, the notices. And so she started working with them. Well, to dissolve a corporation, which the Pope can do, there is a due diligence period. So there's a seven-year due diligence period in which she wrote all the notices to the United States of America Corporation and letting them know that they are being put on notice to dissolve all their corporation and so you might have experienced a little financial something in 2008 yeah that was when the united states corporation was first dissolved and that was because of the and all the work that she was doing and then Pope Francis stepped in because Pope Benedict quit because he's like, I can't handle all this crazy. And he, like, literally quit. Like, I quit. Mm. And then Pe Pope Francis was taking over. And then he allowed the United States to just create another corporation. Mm. 
So then there's this constant thing where you keep hearing, and you can go look at this, look it up, but DC is there. They're at work. They're not at work. They're at work. They're not at work. They can't be at work for six weeks or seven weeks or eight weeks. Yeah, I don't really know the rules, okay? Look it up. <laughs> but between six and eight weeks, they can't be in session every single time they dissolve a corporation and start a new one. So now they just keep moving money and liquidating and playing this liquidate the corporation game. So they create a bunch of crimes under one corporation and then they liquidate and then they create a bunch of crimes under another corporation and liquidate. And meanwhile, Anna keeps putting notices because you keep giving notice to them. And <laughs> There's a lot of, there's a little war going on. I wasn't know. aware of this, so yeah. I'm going to have to look into this. Yeah, look into it. There's a lot happening. So, but, you know, everybody's been put on notice. And simultaneously, all 50 states have risen. We have assemblies in all 50 states. And we're trying to populate the rest of them to create the drill assembly. So we have to lift, put up the four pillars of each state, which requires you to have a militia which requires you to have, and the militia, you guys, is not just the, you know, well-trained, you know, uh, uh, the men, and you know, men and women who can, who are capable men and women, that's yep. not all the militia is. The militia is also the food, it's also the water, it's also the utilities, and you know, whatever, the infrastructure. infrastructure. And so, we're all creating all of that from scratch. And so I got involved with them because, you know, my mission is what? Freedom. To reestablish the small family farm food system. Yep. I just want real food for real the babies, food. and I don't want us to kill the babies. Because they're just killing the babies, because they've created these baby factories under the Vatican, which is this human trafficking problem that we're having, which is for the blood. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, Catholic Charities has been uh, supported a lot of the uh, trafficking and things. 100%. One hundred Yeah. Let's just, the only thing I'm going to say on behalf of the Pope is that the Vatican is the administrative branch and the Pope is the holy branch. But the Pope owns everything and has the ability to dissolve any jurisdiction, I mean any, not jurisdiction, any corporation. Because as the as the leader of the air jurisdiction, yeah. you know, he owns all the corporations. He owns all the trademarks. He can liquidate anything he wants. Well, yeah, I know. Uh, <coughs> well, I've heard of Operation Gladio, and I think that was a CIA involvement with the, the Catholic Church and the Vatican Bank. Mm. <coughs> and so... Um, they, I believe they use that bank to do a lot of things. Uh, well, they because, launder money everywhere because right. they're, we, because <laughs> banks aren't what bank, like a bank is supposed to hold gold or something. Well, these banks aren't doing any of that. The other thing you need to know is that, you know, the Pope and the Vatican, they own and run the postal service. Now we have contracted with these people. Like, you need to understand. We contracted with England, we contracted with the Vatican because, A, we needed a navy. So when we were the 13 colonies, we contracted with England to protect us on the sea so that we could have, you know, commercial trade. Regular commerce. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to operate in commerce. Yeah. So that was why we did it. Um, I mean, you know, you guys just need to know and understand that that is how nations work. They operate with trade agreements. And um, they have effectively, you know, taken over. So when Abraham Lincoln usurped us, he created the United States of America Corporation in all caps. And there's a lot more to this. I break it all down in the podcast and stuff, so just tune in and listen every week. Is there, is there a, like, a progression from... Like where you started and getting yeah. into some of this stuff. Yeah, and, and going. kind of. If you go to my channel, you guys, I did. I started with the the law, the law of nature series that I did, and so I only ever really had time to do five weeks at a time. So I did the law of nature, and then I did a series on dissolving illusions, and then I ended it with an interview that I did with Anna. At which time, at the end of that interview, she was like, "We should just do this every week," and I was like, "Really?" I mean, I never thought that she would be wanting to do that. And so now I launched the United States of America podcast with her. 
because she's that's the real United States of America. And, you know, I, there's a lot. Just come and learn more. But what you need to, like, a lot of people are like, oh, this sounds crazy. Or you hear about a whole lot of people out there. There's like 100 people out there, you know, saying things like, be a sovereign citizen. Well, sovereign citizenship is an oxymoron, okay. and you're a moron if you say that you're a sovereign citizen, because sovereign is free and citizen is slave, so that's ridiculous. Um, don't do that. Yeah. Also, you know, like, understand language, you know? We're manipulated a lot through the, uh, the language, yeah. Yeah, you need to really study the etymology of language. If you're not going to study language, you're going to have a lot of problems, and it's going to be your fault because, like me, we're choosing what we're don't doing all the time, right? right? I mean, we're the creator of our reality. Yeah. And so, you know, that's the other thing, right? They made a joke about it, and they were just like, oh, you think you create your own reality? Yeah, we actually do with our thoughts. Yeah. Like, you know, I think... I want to get up now and go and do something else, and I just get up and go do something else. That's how it works. (laughs) That's what we do. We decided we wanted to be here, and here we are. We took the action. Yes. Came to the destination. Talked to the people. Yep. We create our reality. Right. Boom. (laughs) Here we are. (laughs) It's all your choices, yeah. Choose wisely. Choose that's, wisely, yeah. That's, that's the red pill, blue pill. <laughs> you know, so choose wisely. Like, you get to choose. Remember, you guys, you get to choose. You can call the blue pill the positive polarity and the red pill the negative polarity. And, you know, for it to be, a, for it to be, a, like, for it to succeed and for you to, to move on to the next level, you have to, what's fascinating is you can only be 52% positive and you can move on. But you got to be 95% negative for to move on in that direction. And there's only been a few people that have ever been able to do that, like Genghis Khan. Like you got to be really freaking That's evil. Pretty evil, yeah. You got to be really evil, like because you think about it, you have to just be hating and angry and evil all the time. Destructive. Yeah. Right. But you got to do that through multiple lifetimes. So most people can't make it because you come back in another life and you're probably going to be positive. So. Love wins. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry to disappoint, but, you know, love is a divine solvent of everything. That's beautiful. Yeah. Have fun, you guys. Do whatever you want and just know that you got to choose positive or choose negative. And no matter what you do, you can't get it wrong. And well, yeah. go follow Neeti at uh, Neeti the Pharmacist on YouTube. Yeah, Neeti the Pharmacist on YouTube. You can also go to the United States of America dash. I don't know if it's a dash. I think it's just a T A S A for the American State Assemblies. Okay. Also know that you don't just come back to the land and soil by filling out some form and mailing it to somebody. That's not how you do it. You would actually get with your state assembly. If you aren't in touch with them, then you can go to the TASA website. That is also in on my link tree. Um, if you follow me on Instagram at Nikki the Pharmacist, then it's in my link tree. All the stuff is in my link tree. Okay. Well, Neeti, thank you so much for sitting down with me and uh, sharing with your wisdom and uh, your story um, and what you're currently up to. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. You always do such a great job, and I appreciate all your work. And it was good to run into you again this time. Yeah. So um, it's always fun catching up. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good. Yeah. That was long. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.